Hello and welcome to this podcast. Uh, I'm Paul Abel, director of the Mercury and Venus section, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague Pete Lawrence, who everyone I'm sure will know from BBC Sky at Night, and of course, very, very frequent contributor to Sky at Night magazine. He's also a, a section member and regularly contributes his observations of Venus to the section. So welcome to the podcast, Pete. Hello, Paul. Thank you for inviting me. That's all right. No one else was available. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with Venus. It's been a really prominent object in the evening sky, hasn't it? Oh, it's been amazing. It's it's a beautiful object. It's um it's one of the things I really got first interested in when I started imaging actually. Um and it, it's a bit sort of bittersweet when it comes to imaging because um, it's wonderful to see the phase of Venus when you look at it through a telescope when you try to capture it with a camera but it's hard work getting any detail out of the planet. It is quite a difficult planet to get detail out both visually as well I mean if you're going to visually look at Venus you need to be sort of sensitive towards the bluer end of the spectrum because that's where the markings lie and the images that show the most detail on Venus of course are in UV which isn't easy to do. No it's not um, with a UV filter fitted to your telescope I mean a lot of telescopes like Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes popular ones which are available on the market have a corrector plate on the front which is got a UV coating on it which actually blocks some of the UV coming in so immediately the image is dimmed um, but a UV filter for example something like the uh, the Barda um, UV filter uh, which is often used for Venus is uh, doesn't pass an awful lot of um, light into the telescope so you really struggle to actually get to a decent image with that, which has got the um, the detail on it. But the detail is there with a the UV filter, UV pass filter. So that's what you have to do to, to get the results. Yes, and uh, I've seen some lovely images this elongation. People have sent in some really striking UV images with some really complex cloud patterns on Venus, the sort that I haven't really seen before. So it's certainly the case that amateurs are producing some excellent results. Uh, at the moment, uh, Venus is a crescent, and I think this is one of the loveliest views of Venus uh, when it's in this phase. It's a, it's quite astonishing, actually, to look at the crescent, and it's... Um... It's very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, addictive when you actually go outside and you see it on one day or you image it on another, uh, on a day and then you go out and see it on consecutive days because it's getting thinner and thinner and larger and larger. The apparent size goes up to almost an arc minute across and so it's quite compelling to try and keep the observations going as far as you can. But there's a danger this time round because... Um, Venus passes to the north of the Sun, if I remember correctly, um, by about half a degree on the 3rd of uh, June. So it's half a degree away from the centre of the Sun. So that's going to place it really, really close. And one thing that people have done in the past, because um, I was actually looking at some images of um, Venus the other the other day actually uh, from 2015 when we had an inferior conjunction then um, the planet actually passed eight degrees from the center of the sun so it was possible to follow it all the way through inferior conjunction but this time it's going to be way too close it is. Uh, I, as much as I love to follow uh, the, the planet through inferior conjunction, I should explain. Inferior conjunction is when Venus passes between the Earth and the Sun and it stops being in the evening sky and then reappears in the morning sky. Uh, it's a great thing to do because you, you get these, this phenomenon called the extensions of the cusp caps uh, and they appear to form these thin needles of light that can extend all the way around the disc and it's good fun to watch them tilt over as the planet passes through inferior conjunction but it's not a good idea to do that this time is it well in theory you can do it but we should put a warning out that anybody that does try to do it does it at their own risk because basically um if you want to start to see the cusp extensions going round the edge of the planet uh, you need to probably be within about two and a half degrees from the sun. So that's getting pretty close. I can remember I actually caught um, the full atmospheric ring. Uh, it's the only time I've managed to do it 
Um, well, there was another time when I nearly, I'll explain that in a second. Um, but there was a, a time when I did manage to get uh, the full atmospheric ring when uh, Sky and I went out to Svalbard to image um, the transit of Venus back in 2012. And I can remember being very awkwardly positioned kneeling down on a gravel drive um that was not very nice on the knees um, with a, a cloak over my head trying to locate venus and just managed to sort of catch it and i've got the full atmospheric uh, ring that you can see there um but that was quite dodgy it was really it was so close you had to sort of look in the front of the telescope to make sure that the light passing down wasn't actually going and it was passing down the front of the telescope it wasn't going right the way down to the bottom where the camera was because that would have damaged the camera that's cutting it really fine yes it, it absolutely uh, and I, I was mentioning the other time um that was back at the previous um transit of venus back in 2004 and i actually did manage to to get a nice shot through my refracting telescope at the time and i i was sort of taking images to try and locate Venus in the frame and um, in between because it's the safe thing to do I was putting the front cap on the telescope and I managed to get a shot put it on the computer looked at it oh yeah there it is and went outside and took loads of other shots so I could stack them all together and I forgot to take the, take the cap off the front of the telescope. So I only actually got one shot of it. Well, at least you have it. I mean, it's something I've always wanted to see. I've never actually seen it visually. So it's uh, on my list of, of, of things to try and observe. Uh, of course, the 2012 uh, Venus transit, uh, I was on the beach with Patrick. Uh, we were observing it. We got a clear spell. I think you had wall-to-wall -wall sunshine in Svalbard. And, uh, uh, no, no, we didn't. We, um, we arrived. Um, and it was beautifully clear and um, we had to get some various shots from around the archipelago so um, we went out on a cruise and um, just there was lots of pretty shots for the show etc to sort of introduce the locale um, and then I can remember coming back and um, we sort of just um, said our good nights I mean the sun was up all the time there so you basically went into a room with thick curtains and pretended it was night and I can remember waking up in the next morning um, to a call from our producer saying uh, we need, need you down here in about an hour's time and pulling back the curtains and it was thick cloud and I was so upset that I thought I'm just not going to bother I was it's just it's one of those things if you're a really active observer it just it hits you it's like you know you've been punched in the gut i guess because uh, you think oh for goodness sake after such a beautifully clear introduction to it um but we persisted we we got the kit out and um sort of just tried to do the bits to uh camera on the day and um some gaps came along and broke up and I can, I can remember very distinctly, actually, I was, I was doing an interview with Chris Lintot at the time. And Chris knows me of old. And as the gaps started to appear, he, he just said, right, and we're, we're going to wander away over here and leave Pete to it because he could see what was going to happen. I was just going to, <laughs> to ignore, ignore the interview and go and do the observation. And uh, after that, we did get quite a few gaps. So we did see most of it. Yes, it was nice to see it from Selsey Beach. OK, let's let's move back to how Venus is going to look uh, in our telescopes over the next couple of months or so. Um, on the 1st of May, it's going to be 24% illuminated. Now, Venus is coming closer to us in its orbit and the phase is dropping down. So it'd be 10% on the 15th of May, uh, only 6% on the 20th. And on the 25th of May, it will be... Uh, 2% and less than 1% on the 30th of May. Okay. So really quite small. Yeah, an inferior conjunction, uh, as we said, uh, is on the 3rd of June. So that's when it's lost from view, basically. Yeah, so then after that, it'll appear in the morning sky. And of course, it'll still be at a low phase uh, for the rest of May, uh, for the rest of June. Uh, but there is an interesting thing uh, amateur astronomers advanced amateur astronomers i guess could do and that's image the night side of venus and this is something i've been very keen for section members who could do it to have a go at because 
Personally, I think there are probably still active volcanoes down on Venus and imaging hotspots, even just imaging the night side, although it's quite challenging, it could be a new line of research for the section. And you've had some success recently in imaging the, the night side. So could you tell us a bit about how it's done, what you need to do, and what, what kind of luck you've had in doing it? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm of the school that um, when I try to do this sort of stuff, I try to do it. Um, off my own back so I sort of like to do the experiments and get various filters and things and just try and work out how to do it and it's taken quite a long time I have to say um, to sort of do uh, or to have some success with it but basically what you need to do you need to have um, a camera which is sensitive um, into the infrared, infrared part of the spectrum you need to have an infrared pass filter, probably over 950 nanometers. You, you might be able to do it a little bit under that, but you need to experiment with that. Um, and you need to have the telescope you're using on a mount which is properly polar aligned. So uh, the reason for that is that you're going to do long exposures or long compared to how a planet would normally be exposed. Normally we're doing millisecond exposures on planets. But for this, you probably need to go up anywhere between 8 to 10 seconds of exposure time. So you need it needs to be a long exposure, which is going to completely overexpose the bright day lit side of the planet. And what you're going to end up with is um, a number of images which then need to be stacked together now a little tip here if you're if you're doing normal planetary imaging where you um you say i'm just going to use i don't know 15 20 percent of the images which i've captured so for example if you captured a thousand frames you're using 150 to 200 frames to to actually stack together uh, to produce a nice sharp image of the planet here you need to use virtually all of them if you've got some which are blurred obviously they need to be rejected but you need to use as many as you possibly can because you're not going to get that many at a 10 second exposure time um, and it's such a weak signal that's the trick you've got to have a lot of images which you can put together and by a lot i'm not talking about the usual number of planetary images i'm talking about um, say into the 100 maybe 200 if you're lucky uh, and what about things like technical things like the gain do you have to really up the gain on your on your camera whilst you're trying to capture the night side how does that work it's better to try and keep the um, the gain down um, but invariably I don't always do that and I do let it drift up a bit I've um, the last success I had um, bearing in mind I'm using a 14 inch telescope um, my exposure times um, were eight seconds uh, I had my gain set to 29 percent and um, the gamma was adjusted slightly as well it was 59 percent so just up a little bit from where it would normally be it's normally set at 50 so that actually got me with a hundred frames I captured 101 frames um, it actually revealed the uh, night side for me fairly clearly now the camera I was using for that was um, it's getting very technical here but it was the ZWO ASI 224 MC which is a color camera which is very um, good at capturing infrared uh, the infrared part of the spectrum the big problem with it is that it it also um, generates a, a, a quite an odd pattern in the camera when you do long exposures with a bright object like that so it looks a bit like a Christmas bauble uh, when, when it's actually done its stuff so you need to be careful that um, some of the the artifacts which are created in the camera don't get misconstrued as features on the night side uh, the last with the settings I've just described I I think I was overexposing on the day side so again the iterative process of learning um, will have me reducing that and trying to get more um, frames to bring together so give me a stronger signal uh, but less intrusive uh, or intrusion from the overexposed part of the crescent 
Right. Okay. Well, this is well perhaps one way of reducing the 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 errors to see if the there are artifacts in there or not is to take uh, some images over the course of an hour. So if there is anything in there uh, that still persists, it, it's likely to be a, a a genuine surface feature rather than just a processing artifact. That's true, except that you have to obviously um, you've got your time limited on when you can take the shots because the sun does need to be below the horizon for you to try to capture the um, nighttime stuff ideally so typically the guidance there is for about five degrees below the horizon so that limits how long the planet will be above the horizon especially as it's starting now to move back in towards the sun it's no wonder there that there aren't lots and lots of images of the night side of Venus. It does seem like quite a challenge. Yeah, that's right. Um, I should also point out, actually, I've been having a chat with Anthony Wesley um, about filters. Um, he, he, I think, believe he uses the Edmund Scientific um, f- filters for this. I'm, I'm using um, it's quite embarrassingly cheap actually for an astronomical filter it's about 13 pounds it costs me um that's the kind of filter i like <laughs> <laughs> and that's a um a one micron filter um which came from a company who i can't remember at the moment i'll have to dig those details out and you can uh, you can put them somewhere yeah for people to uh, to locate hopefully a number of amateurs will try to image the the night side as venus goes into the, continues in the crescent stage into the morning sky but there's still a good opportunity to follow venus in the morning sky into uv images and i'm told one of the most difficult things with that is to focus the uh, the camera for, for imaging for uv imaging is that the case oh it's horrendous it's really difficult because um you're still subject to the vagaries of atmospheric seeing and i don't i don't know i think visually you might have an advantage there because it's it's slightly easier to snap to what you believe is a is a focused view of um venus but with imaging because you're often working at a reasonable image scale um it, it you can just wander slightly through focus or or slightly out of focus the other side and it because the atmosphere is wobbling things about it's very difficult to determine where the actual point of focus is it's similar to solar actually um sometimes when you're doing solar imaging you can see um that places where the sun looks like it's in focus as you're adjusting and you lock onto that position, and then suddenly the seeing adjusts itself, and it's completely out of focus. And you think, oh, and then you rewind it to get that position, and then it'll wander off somewhere else. So it's sort of this constant motion in the atmosphere on these really um, a sharp, bright planet like Venus seems to make it really difficult to actually get a chief focus. Yes, I have heard this. Uh, I did, one of the things I obviously being a visual observer uh, when the seeing is good you actually you, you get a nice sharp image of venus and you could draw in the terminator so measuring the phase uh, of venus i actually do from drawings rather than images because even in a good sharp image the terminator itself could be very very shaded and quite difficult to it's not a hard boundary it's quite soft and again i suppose that's linked in with what you're saying about uh, imaging and focusing at imaging yeah, and don't forget that um, if you're working with UV, you're at the extreme blue end of the spectrum or beyond the blue end of the visual spectrum. Um, and it's the, the short wavelengths which are affected quite badly by seeing. Um, the longer wavelengths towards the red end of the spectrum are are less affected, so you tend to get a sharper image with that. Um, so it, it is it is a tricky thing to get right. OK, well, we've talked here about some quite technical things that amateurs can do, quite advanced stuff. Let's move to some more basic stuff, because we have a couple of nice events that require nothing more than a pair of eyes coming up. Uh, the first of those is Venus and Mercury are going to be close together in the sky in May, at the evening sky. So this is a good chance to find Mercury if you've never seen it before. In actual fact, a lot of people haven't seen Mercury, particularly if they live in towns because it's very low down. So we have a nice encounter with Venus and Mercury coming up towards the end of May. We do indeed. And this is going to be quite good because um, Mercury is going to be quite bright um, and it's going to get very close to Venus. So, so long as the clouds play ball, we've had some fantastic clear weather 
of late. It's as I say that it's raining outside at the moment. It is. As soon as it's quarantine time, all of the weather goes wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's it's sort of uh, the the critical um, time is going to be from about the twentieth of May. So um, on the twentieth of May. Uh, they're going to the planets are going to be 3.3 degrees apart. So Venus is going to be magnitude minus 4.2, and Mercury is going to be minus 0.7. So that's pretty bright for Mercury. Um, and then on the 21st of May, evening of the 21st, they're 1.4 degrees apart. And then on the 22nd, when they're at their closest, they're 1.3 degrees apart. So. Uh, and it's still quite bright, actually, on the, the 22nd, um, because Mercury will be mag- minus 0.5 at that time. So if we do get clear skies, it should be a great opportunity to see see Mercury. Yes, I always find Mercury visually to be slightly orange when when seen, either with the naked eye or I've only seen it through a telescope once, actually, uh, uh, which is why our Mercury coordinator, Chris Hooker, deals with Mercury, not me, because he has a lot more experience of observing it than I do. But do you, do you find it's this orange colour? I do know what you mean. Um, it's slightly, I think, how would I describe it? A slightly pinky hue to it. That's how I would describe it. Um, I mean, I've seen Mercury quite a few times, um, and I've imaged it during the day, um, which is the best time to do it, to be honest, because it's high up then, because it never gets that far from the sun, so it's always being affected quite badly by um, low atmospheric seeing. Um, so if you catch it during the day, that's a good time to catch it. And actually, on the 22nd of May, when it's really close to Venus, um then that's probably a good time if you can locate Venus in in the day to try and get a a shot of Mercury. Mercury will be pretty small. It'll be about a tenth the size of Venus, uh, about six arc seconds across, and it will be showing a phase of 67%, so a gibbous uh, Mercury at that time. Um, But that's, that's... when it's high up in the sky and you've got Venus nearby, that's a good way to locate it. That's a lot of fun, you know. This um, We're talking about sort of uh, locating and the, the visual views and whatever, but it is quite a lot of fun locating these planets during the day. I know you've done it a few times, haven't you? I do. I do. It's actually how I prefer to observe Venus. Um, I'm quite lucky when Venus is fairly bright. I, I can see in the daytime sky with no difficulty. Otherwise, I offset from the sun. But I, I do like the added challenge uh, of, you know, using the setting circles, offsetting from the sun and then getting Venus that way. Um, I, I've yet to do it with Mercury, but I think it will be my preferred way of doing it. But as you say, Pete, it's a good challenge to, to do, providing we're safe. Well, it's one of those things that I've, you know, I've done it in the past um, and you locate Venus and you think, crikey, that was hard work. And then you sort of line up the telescope and whatever if you're doing it visually. uh, And it helps bizarrely if there are a few sort of puffy clouds in the sky because you can use those as reference points once you've seen it. Um, Yes, they help focus your eyes. I do notice actually on the... um... On the 23rd of May, uh, Venus and Mercury are joined by, is it the 1% lit crescent moon? Yeah, a very thin uh, crescent moon. So uh, that's going to be a difficult one because the moon's going to sit um, 6.3 degrees vertically below Venus uh, as we see it from the UK on that evening. So it's going to set pretty soon after the, after the sun compared to the planets. And 1% is a difficult moon to pick up. Um, if you've ever tried to get a thin moon but on the um, on the 24th then the moon will be a bit further into its phase cycle so it should be um, it should be much more obvious in fact that'll be the last opportunity we get for this apparition of venus to have a crescent moon nearby it's not going to be as dramatic as it has been when um, venus and the moon have been higher up in a dark twilight sky this is going to be in a bright twilight sky because venus is going to be really close to um, the sun point at that time Um, but it should be something that adds that little bit of extra to the scene so um, well worth trying to grab if you can um, in that uh, in that particular direction that's over towards the northwest isn't it yeah i think that'll be a fun thing to go for and i'm hoping we have clear skies in in Leicestershire for for that. Uh, there's there's one final event we should talk about because this is quite nice. This is a occultation of 
Venus by the Moon, which occurs on the 19th of June. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about that. Well, these are, are fascinating. I remember my first ever lunar occultation of Venus. It was a virtually completely cloudy sky. There were a few gaps, and it was a real struggle to actually get the Moon through the telescope and then focus it and then pick out Venus and that was magical to actually see it because the thing which people don't really appreciate is the fact that Venus is a lot brighter than the moon um, you might think that's just crazy it, you know the moon stands out much better than Venus but when you put them side by side the um, the brightness of Venus's atmosphere really stands out it's like a beacon compared to the dimmer surface of the moon if you see photographs of uh, the pair of them close together, then that's um, that's quite impressive. Um, but for this one, um, yes, it's on the 19th of June. Uh, the disappearance occurs at 0738 UT. Um, so that's when um, the skies will be bright. So the, the trick with this one is to get up really early before the sun has come up. So it's sort of the morning twilight to locate the moon and Venus. And if you have a telescope with a polar mount with a drive on it, then just choose one of those objects and align it with them and then stick with them as the sun comes up and the sky gets bright. Venus is probably the easier. easier. So you mean sort of take the telescope, focus on Venus, turn your drive on and keep tracking Venus until the uh, occultation time arrives? Absolutely, yeah. And it'll be the, the bright limb of the moon which um, dis, uh, Venus disappears behind. And it's pretty quick as well. It's quite stunning to actually watch an event like this occurring. If you have uh, binoculars, you should be able to pick it up fairly clearly. Uh, the moon will be quite dim in the bright sky, but you should be able to pick it up, especially with Venus as a guide. Um, and then at 0843 UT... Uh, Venus will reappear from behind the dark limb of the moon. And um, that's quite stunning as well to watch watch the planet, this bright planet, just come back into, into view. And Venus, of course, will be showing a crescent, as will the moon at this time. So um, you'll be able to compare the sizes of those two beautiful celestial crescents. Yeah, that'll be a pretty good event. So plenty to look forward to uh, with regards to Mercury and Venus in the in the skies. Pete, I want to thank you very much for, for joining me on this podcast. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. A pleasure, yes, as always, to talk to you. Did, did that sound sincere? No, but then I wasn't expecting it to sound sincere, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> and thanks for, yes, yeah, so thanks for doing that. And if anybody watching has any questions they can email myself uh, or Chris Hooker who is the Mercury coordinator and until next time goodbye <laughs> <laughs>